Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday's daily meditation with Yahel Avigur. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to Sangha Live. We do these daily meditations every day of the week. And we also have sessions on Sunday and Saturday. So you can check out everything on our website, sangha.live. The session runs for one hour and the recording is available at the end of the day normally, uploaded onto our website. And we spend a little bit of time hearing some Dharma wisdom on a particular theme. This week we're exploring the theme of Samadhi, a path to reliable joy. And um, after the instruction, the wisdom sharing, then we, we have some meditation time to practice what we're we're learning, what we're exploring. And then we have some time for questions or reflections, um, sharing whatever's coming up with you, for you with the teacher. And to do that, you can post a question in the chat, or you can also use the little raise, a, raise your hand icon at the bottom of the screen if you would like to come on screen and talk. All right. And thank you very much for if you've already offered Donna this week, thank you. If you're planning to, thank you. If you're not able to at this moment, if your financial situation doesn't support you to be able to offer Donna, please feel very, very welcome to be here. Um, that's the beauty of the system. We support each other through our practice and through um, when we can offer, we offer. That supports Sangha Live but it also, and the teacher. It also supports others to be here. So... Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you soon. George will be with you tomorrow, so it won't be me, but um, until next time. Thanks, Yael. Thank you, Faith, for introducing today and the previous days as well. It was really a pleasure. And hello, everyone. It's good to be here, good to sit together again. There are infinite possible ways to understand and experience and perceive this thing we call life. We have such a short time here. really a brief moment and incredibly precious. Time that can be called life. And a huge part of how we will experience perceive, feel into our life, our journey in this world, the sense of who we are, the sense of who others are, to a huge extent, in a way to an infinite extent, that is dependent on our perception. And perception doesn't only mean story or words. Partly it means the way our senses arrange themselves and the way our mind in a way creates or participates in what we perceive outer and inner and perceive it through our participation. Part of what we may want to cultivate in the practice of the Dharma is flexibility and malleability of perception. So we're less locked in habitual, inert ways of seeing ourselves and others and are more able to approach and perceive self and others in ways that are compassionate, conducive to compassion and inspiring for us.
the quality or the direction of our perception, the direction of how we sense self and other, is again immeasurably influenced by the qualities that are alive in our heart and mind. When the heart and mind are suffused with kindness, compassion, generosity, patience, self and world arise very differently comparing to times in which the mind is suffused with ill will, sense desire, agitation, etc. And we create the world around us through these qualities for our own perception and through our actions for others. We are participating anyway all the time. If we want to care about how we perceive and experience the world and about what we contribute the cultivation of beautiful qualities of the heart and mind should be a priority for us. And the quality, the line of samadhi is central. It's the ability to tune into, to make the body and the heart and the mind available for beautiful qualities, to enjoy them, to embody them and to sustain them. So our practice of samadhi is part of our journey towards a more inspiring participation. And it is a training that helps us in that. There are many aspects to this skill, or we can even say art, of samadhi. Yesterday I spoke about the balance of effort. That has nuances. One can think about or play with the practice of effort quite generally. One can also play with modes of attention. If you're focusing on a spot in the body, you can invite your attention to be quite penetrating, quite directed. Or you can invite it to be much more receptive, receiving whatever is arising as if into your attention, into your awareness. This will create quite a different experience and it's a spectrum, it's not really binary. But it's worth learning to play with it. It's part of the skill and art of samadhi, it's the skill and art of these modes of attention. Another mode of attention that you can play with is the level of intensity of attention. One can pay attention, can tune into something in the body, and that's true for outer things as well, although a bit subtler to notice. One can notice or pay attention to in quite an intense way. And one can pay attention or notice in quite a subtle, light way. It is quite often the case that with the development of one's meditation, the perception of body and sometimes the perception of other things becomes more and more subtle. And with the subtlety of perception, the subtlety of experience, the attention needs to be correspondingly subtle. Quite often with samadhi, it's really worth experimenting and learning the art of very light attention. Often people associate steadiness with a kind of intensity or pushing. That is not necessarily the case, really not. And quite often, very light attention given quite steadily with patience and care can serve much better than an intention that uh, attention that's quite intense.
as I spoke about already with regard to Samadhi, some, or actually quite a big part of this art and skill has to do with the sensitivity to the whole body. And some of you shared in the chat that it's not an obvious thing, not necessarily an easy thing. And yes, that will be the case for many people, probably most. However, this is something, or it is something that we do want to cultivate. Spreading, expanding our attention to the field of the whole body. It can be a bit broader, a bit wider than the boundaries of the, of the physical body. And noticing the vibrations, the frequencies there. One can take that sensitivity really as one's central line of work and do that primarily, or focus on breath or metta, like we did in the previous meetings, and from there attend to the whole body as a kind of background. At a minimum level, this may allow an attunement of one's effort. It can be quite easy to get locked into a meditative kind of um, inquiry or paying attention to something a little bit narrow and not really monitoring the level of effort. And it's not uncommon that pressure is being built there in the background without you even noticing. So the sensitivity to the whole body gives you a kind of monitoring. It also makes your samadhi more inclusive. It's harder to focus on something while in the background things are building up maybe anger, maybe, maybe intensity, maybe all sorts of things that you're not aware of. If you're sensitive to the whole body, it gives you a broader kind of sense of what's going on. And we want that. We want our samadhi to be inclusive, to include multiplicity of level, levels of our being. the sensitivity to the whole body will tend to shrink. It will happen. It will happen much more than once. And you will need to open it again and again, invite to open. You can imagine it stretching or kind of stretch your awareness with your intention, or you can take a more receptive approach and ask yourself, how does this whole field feel? As if inviting the whole field of your body to your awareness. A little bit like we said before, I said before about the more penetrating more mode and the more receptive mode. And you will find your own ways. Of course, you can also use the breath or the metta to um, open the body. You can radiate metta to or from your legs and then the metta kind of expands down. You can radiate metta from the uh, upper part of the body and the metta radiates up and we played with it a little bit in the guided meditations with it. Now, with the sensitivity to the whole body, it can be a really good idea to tune to from the beginning any sense of well-being is even slight pleasure in the body. And really from the beginning, some people want to meditate for quite a while and build a sense of well-being and then approach it when it's really big, and that's fine. But for others, it can be really helpful just from the beginning include that. Our perception of the body can so easily tend towards what is not helpful or it's not necessarily not helpful, but what is challenging, what is contracted, what is closed. And the attention can go there again and again and become quite influenced by that and by the natural aversion that comes in a response to that. And we don't know it or notice it, but our attention can be colored by aversion. That's a huge thing and there is much to say about it. I won't say everything now. But now I'll just say that from the beginning, you are invited to sense into what is okay in the field of the body and actually train yourself 
in this field of the body, there will be many different textures, many different vibrations, some of them pleasant, some of them unpleasant, and some neutral. And it's actually a valuable training to intentionally, intentionally tune to the vibrations, the frequencies that you want to tune to. When you're tuning to them, your attention becomes more sensitive to them. They grow for your attention and for your experience, and you can get into them and nourish yourself and make them richer. These things, they work a little bit like honey. You know, bees, they make honey, and then they eat the honey, and then they make even better honey because they have the nourishments or the nutrients coming from the previous one, and it accumulates. So it works the same with this relatively pleasurable sense that's created in the body through your meditation. And you can tune into it, and it actually increases the kind of goodness of your practice. We can do that together with the breath or the metta, bring the well-being into the stream of that, and let it join the stream of intentions, words, imagination, if we're practicing metta, or the breath, energy, if we're practicing the breath. Or we can attune to it in and of itself. Sometimes it's just the case that you need to practice with the breath or the metta and sense how it ripples, how it echoes in the body. And that will already open a sense of well-being. Often when, you're, when you will stretch or open your sensitivity to the whole body, there will be something slightly pleasant in that, in that very opening, because it's a reduction of clinging, a reduction of uh, uh, contraction. And with that openness, there will be some ease and you can tune into that. You can also play with these things when you're upset or agitated or anxious. You can sense the breath flowing in some way, in a way that's easing, that's soothing, and let your whole body feel that. Or invite the metta to echo in the field of your, of your body with the anxiousness, with the agitation, and let it soothe and be sensitive to that with the whole body. So the sense of well-being is not necessarily divorced from difficulty. There are many frequencies, and you can intentionally tune, intentionally tune to the ones that are helpful for you now, even as others can be quite dominant sometimes. To encourage some sense of well-being, you can also use imagination. In a way, it's already there. We invited it in with a breath. We definitely used it with a metta. Why not imagine the body as a cloud of light or a gently radiating field of, li field of light? We are imagining the body anyway all the time, either we like it or not. So why not imagine it like that? You can have the metta kind of flowing down, touching the body. Sometimes when I have strong pains, I imagine dewdrops of metta on and around this place of pain. And that brings or allows some sense of well-being to come around it. And then it enters the perception of the whole body and starts to change things, allows things to be more malleable and playable. All right, let's practice for a while. As we are alternating between breath and metta meditation as our vehicles towards samadhi, Today, we'll invite you to a meta practice. So please find a way to sit. You can also walk or stand.
in a way that feels supportive for you today. Check with your body, what does it need? In terms of external supports, arranging the chair or cushions, or the place in which you stand or lie down. And what is needed in terms of the arrangement of the body itself. Take your time with it. The posture is such an important support or can be such an important support. When we allow it and respect it as such. Allow the base of your body to be broad and heavy. You can imagine it sinking down a little bit. We're sending roots down deep into the earth. Let your body enjoy a sense of groundedness. And invite your body to enjoy uprightness, openness. Inviting it to open up. Out of enjoyment and love of openness. more than artificial effort. And then you can scan your body, touching and relaxing.
starting from the upper part of the body, maybe the top of the head, sensing and relaxing, easing the muscles there, and naturally flowing down the back of the head and the face. the back of the neck and the throat and the shoulders. Sensing and relaxing, respecting your body with kind attention. moving, flowing down through the hands, all the way to the palms of the hands. And then down the back. All through the spine, its right part, its left part. All the way down. Touching and relaxing. into the pelvis and the legs, all the way down. And then back to the lower belly and chest. Giving your awareness to the body and giving your body to awareness. Touching and relaxing, whatever is tense. As an expression of compassion. The patience. Then sensing into the whole body. Check with yourself if there is an attitude of demand with regard to how the body should feel or be sensed. Perhaps relax this demand to whatever extent possible. You can take some good, long, in and out breaths. To nourish the body in this way.
and then find the center, a location. Where your attention can sit and settle and open from. As we're tuning to Metta, the heart area can be such a natural location, but if a different spot feels more natural, that's okay too. If you want, you can invite the sense of your attention to drop down from the head to that center. You can even imagine it flowing down, settling there, and from there opening up to the whole body, radiating out to the whole body. So a center of awareness and sensitivity to the whole body. The sensitivity to the whole body will tend to shrink. Invited to open again and again. See if there is a way to make the sensitivity to the whole body as loving and caring as possible. Attention or sensitivity are never a neutral factor. They are always doing something. Can they do that? Radiate care, love. Simply radiating from your heart or the center of your attention to the whole body. Nothing dramatic, really. but it can be so easy that one's attention will say all the time, it shouldn't be like this, shouldn't be like that, should be a bit more like this or that. Can the sensitivity say, can the awareness say instead of that, may you be well, however you are, whoever you are, may you be well. If this or another phrase sounds like it can work for you. You can tweak your inner speech 
in order to just repeat that. May you be well. Before compassion is needed, may you be free from suffering. And with that, expanding the sensitivity to the whole body. Let's sit with it for just a few minutes. Opening, respecting the whole body. With kind, loving attention. Letting the phrase or the phrases support you. May you be well. you be held in kindness. You can invite the imagination to support you as well, or any way imagining the body. In a subtle level, usually. Why not imagine it as a cloud or a radiating field of light? can be so gentle. You can try different images as well. I've mentioned the image of dewdrops. with their gentleness. Natural kindness, touching the body.
and you can if you wish radiate the metta out all around to all beings sensitive to the whole body and here it's really worth paying attention to aspects of the body that feels okay it feels nice or potentially nourishing and let them join in Let them feed. The embodied aspect of metta. And with it radiate out, maybe to all the beings in front of you, through the front part of the body, through the face and the throat and the chest and belly and pelvis and legs. Let the matter spread there and from there radiate. To everyone and everything in this direction. You can check with yourself. Does it feel better to imagine it spreading out, really stretching to infinity? Or is it better just to let it pulsate gently from the body outwards? Like it naturally does. And here too, of course, you can use the phrases or the imagination. May you be well. May you be held in kindness. or and imagining the light radiating out pulsating metta inseparable from the life of the body to all near and far You can do this similarly with the right part of the body. Sensing it with metta, inviting it to radiate or pulse out. in this same way backwards. The whole back of the body and radiating, pulsing out.
and to your left. And then inviting your attention, your sensitivity to settle at its center and let it naturally radiate kindness to and through the whole body, to all directions, front and back, right and left, up and down. Inviting any sense of well-being or ease to join into the pulsing, to the stream of metta. Giving it generously. And as we're approaching the end of this short meditation session, you can let your bodily posture relax. And make the intention to sustain a metaphor approach to self and other. And then invite your eyes to open as well. Thank you for your practice. So we have some time now, like every day, at least until, until tomorrow for questions, comments, responses, sharings, whatever you want. You're welcome to come in with a raise hand option, which be, will be a nice kind of refreshing thing. Or you can share on the chat. If there is a question, please write question uh, column and then write your question there so I'm clear that it is a question. And again, in that phase as well, an invitation to keep nourishing the sensitivity and the metta. It's actually a precious opportunity to, to practice in the in-between when you're not in formal practice, but there is still the encouragement and support to sustain that.
in the meantime, I can tell you kind of a story. It's not really a story. It's more like uh, tell you something about the suttas. That there are a few places in which the Buddha teaches metta, the practice of metta. One of them is very famous. It's the Metta Sutta, in which he says, well, one that wants to go in the direction of awakening, and I'm rephrasing, needs to hold in mind the approach of kindness to all categories of beings, short and long and far away and nearby. And all sorts, he mentions all sorts of beings there. On another occasion, I won't tell you what he's doing because there are plenty of questions. So I'll respond to the ones on the chat and then I'll invite uh, the one that raised hand. Could I say more about light attention? Any tips? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, the tip is to practice it, basically. Sometimes it's easier when there is like a broader context. Either you're going to really wide attention or the whole body. And then from there, it's easier to give uh, um, light attention. I found that for a lot of people, if there is a habit for heavy attention, and for most people there is this habit, uh, when attention is not trained, it's kind, kind of clunky, you know, um, then it's easier to have some of your attention based somewhere else, either kind of with the whole body or somewhere in the body, or with a wider field, and then inviting the lighter attention in that context. I found that to be quite a helpful tip uh, for people. So that's that's a thing. And just sustaining it again and again. Sometimes, again, an image ha helps. So uh, my teacher, Rob, he sometimes speaks about a feather touching something. You know, and that even keeping that image in mind can help. Or you can think an image is like a hand. It's like subtle subtle placing of a hand. Um, I think I will invite the, per the person who raised hand. If you want to raise a hand again, or I'm not sure how that's technically done, really. Um, but you are very welcome to. All right, in the meantime, I'll respond to the next question. Um, Obviously, your time is bound here. Is there an ideal length of time that you would suggest for this type of meditation? Um, as long as you feel inspired to and available for, Samadhi loves time. <laughs> Samadhi is usually, in, in many ways, it's a slow cooking thing. It's a slow cooking thing in one's practice in general. So it's one of these qualities that are really it just accumulates more and more over the years. Um, and if one's going intentionally in the direction of samadhi, then it will need kind of time to evolve and develop and kind of peak and then it'll fade, but then you can reignite it again. And now I mean again over some weeks or months, etc. In your daily life, the, the, the ideal time is the time that you can sustain and maintain daily. That's the ideal time. What Samadhi really loves, even more than um, uh, uh, length of time, is regularity. So if you can regularly and reliably do 40 minutes a day, that's like, fantastic. If you can do more, that's amazing. I mean, if some people, they can do, you know, and they, some, very few, but some people choose to do like an hour or two maybe some, maybe more even every day and really have that as a period of their day, you know. Um, but if you can't do that and you can do 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, still just, you know, so samadhi is not a very specific thing. It's the orientation of coherency, of harmonization, of um, um, harmonization of the being. Maybe I said that already, it doesn't matter. Um, the gathering of the, of the being. So even the shorter meditations help with that to an extent and help to carry that through a day. So that's good. So basically my answer is like as long, one, as long as you can and feel inspired to, and two, um, the, the, the thing I would prioritize is what you can sustain regularly. <sighs> Mm. 
thank you. It's good to. There's another a few more comments. <laughs> Where I am, I look familiar. Uh, not in England, Cyprus. No, it's uh, it's Tel Aviv. <laughs> I'm in Tel Aviv, which uh, yeah, it's a place to be in these days. If I really take up to develop this, how will I know I'm progressing in the right direction? How is Samadhi supposed to change all the time? All right, that's a fantastic question. Um, first, just in terms of resources, maybe I'll say you can listen to some recorded retreats just to give you much more kind of broader instructions or in-depth instruction, instructions, more that I can give here in this short time we have. Just, I really love this format actually, but. Uh, there are other formats that allow more sometimes, so or more of some things. So uh, there is a retreat by Rob Berbea called The Art of Concentration. And if you really want to go in depth, there is a retreat called um, Practicing the Jhanas. There are also, I think, talks about Samadhi from me on Dharma Seed, but I'm not sure. The talks by Rob are like, you know, he was a true master in Lots of things, but in Dharma talks as well. Um, how would you know it evolves well? Um, one, you can expect a bit more skill with the hindrances. And that's actually a very big thing that I haven't spoke about so much. But working with the hindrances is really a part of samadhi practice. So a little bit, of, a little bit more skill, a little bit less identification with the hindrances is actually a sign. And yeah, skill, I mean, working with them and kind of not letting them take over your mind unconsciously. Um, Ah, oh, great. Thanks, Faith. Um, Faith has put the link in the chat if you haven't seen. Um, then another thing you should expect, and that's really the main kind of unfoldment of Samadhi, you can expect more reliable pleasure coming in through the body, from the body, through your meditation experience, and kind of feeding in your meditation. Think of it like this. It's as if you're med meditating, and from the meditation you extract a kind of extraction of the nourishments there, and then it starts to kind of feed on itself, right? So you can expect a more reliable, more sustained, more continuous pleasure to come, and you can expect your ability to invite you to spread to your whole experience, to your whole body, to become more established. And then when it becomes more and more established, you can turn and nourish on it or enjoy it more and more. And then it will start going through a process of refinement. Now, here I'm speaking about something that can take weeks on what can take week on weeks on or months on a retreat. And uh, can be longer in daily life, but honestly, rhythms are like they change dramatically between people. But the body can become like a place of pleasure. And instead of experiencing a body that experiences pleasure, the body itself becomes a kind of pleasure. Um, and then that pleasure can turn and become more refined into a kind of very stable, very fulfilling, very self-reliant happiness, and then it can refine even more to uh, peace or stillness. But it's a long path, and I wouldn't try to do shortcuts. So I would go seriously for the pleasure, the well-being, the ease that comes from these from this practice, kind of felt bodily, and then let it mature onwards. Ah. <sighs> And then the last question, which I, even though we don't have time, I can't really not answer. Being in a war zone, is samadhi practice something you prioritize? So I'll answer uh, for all of us who are in intense or challenging situations, you know, and, and, and this situation I'm in is one of the many intense and, and difficult situations that we'll have in our lifetime. Um, it is hard. I mean, I mean, samadhi is that aspect of practice that will be quite vulnerable to 
shifts and changes because it's such a it's a kind of fruit you can think of it as a kind of fruit of practice so it will be vulnerable like fruits are vulnerable you know um they will they will dissolve before or, or will get kind of damaged before the trunk of the tree let's say so often i find myself that i need to come back to the trunk of the tree like something more around mindfulness something more around meta and from there samadhi grows naturally so for me it's kind of already integrated into the other things in practice so you begin where you can and then the quality of samadhi invites itself and you can enjoy it more so that's generally what i would say about how to work in the direction of samadhi when things are kind of challenging and intense yeah all right thanks everyone thank you for being here and with prayers of uh, peace and safety for all people everywhere and here in this region may all be well may all be safe may you be well may you be safe and see you tomorrow Thanks, everyone. Bye.